We all want our content to go viral. We all want more people to see our work. But is going viral luck or is there a way to hack the system? Any viral video you've ever seen, you can tell a friend about it. It's basically like, hey, have you seen the video where blank does blank? And in my mind, if there's a third blank, you've lost it. That's Kevin Perry, a stop motion animator and overall video wizard. He has 10 years of experience in the film and animation industry, and now he uses his skills on social media full time. But Kevin isn't just doing one platform well. He's crushing every platform. He has nearly 2 million subscribers on YouTube, 1.3 million followers on Instagram, 2.3 million followers on TikTok, 200,000 followers on Twitter, and Kevin even has more than 100,000 followers on LinkedIn. Not only is Kevin's content incredibly unique and engaging, but he's so good at packaging that content into something that's shareable that he sets himself up to go viral. I've kind of pinpointed the key to shareability is like how someone tells their friend about your video. Like, hey, have you seen that video where X does X? Like, where that guy turns into a bunch of random stuff, like falls and turns into stuff. If someone can't tell their friend about your video like quickly like that, then you, it's not gonna be shareable. So in this episode, you'll learn how Kevin approaches the different social media platforms, how he works with brands as a one-man studio, how he developed his on-camera presence, and why context determines whether or not your content may go viral. And now, let's talk with Kevin. I studied animation in college, graduated about 12 years ago now, and I specialized in stop motion and worked my way through uh, working on animated feature films. So really learned everything through working on big kind of, you know, Hollywood level productions. And then slowly found my way into social media doing my own animation. What's harder, being good enough at stop motion and animation to get a job on films like that or just getting the job like are there a ton of people that are vying for a few jobs or is it actually a really high bar and there are not enough people with the skill set to do that job well i think with stop motion specifically it's a it's a really high bar especially at that feature film level on most of those films there's about 20 25 animators and it always seems like there's one from every country like everyone's from mm -hmm. a different part because there's one person who's crazy enough in a country to, <laughs> to get to that level. So I, th it, it, I think it's very much that high bar. What does it take to get to that level? Like, how did you, how did you get there? Is it just a lot of practice? Did you have to like learn from somebody else? Because I don't meet a lot of people who have this skill set. And when I come across them on like Instagram, I'm just thrilled because it's fun to follow along, but it does seem very small. So how did you do it? Any stop motion animator, I think they have a passion for observation. That's a less true of a lot of animators. You're observing life, you're observing how people move, how a foot you know, rolls off the ground, how a hair <laughs> flows when someone turns their head. So there's that passion. So it's, it's definitely that, that microscopic observation and just a passion for putting that into a character. I've watched a bunch of your how I did this type videos which I love that you put those out, by the way. I love any discipline putting those out, but when it's like such a visual medium, it's so cool to close that loop and see how things are done. It seems to me like you need just the most patience in the world. Is that true or is that something that is, is I'm overestimating the importance of? A lot of people say that. They say you must have an incredible amount of patience and it's true. All I think all stop motion animators do have a lot of patience, but I don't think we see it as a tedious patience, the way a lot of people do. A lot of people have a, a negative <laughs> um, kind of connotation with patience, that it must be torturous, but we enjoy it so much. And I've always seen it as a puzzle. And you know, every frame, every movement, every little nuance of a performance is like piecing together a puzzle that builds this overall performance. So I love that. I When I'm in that tedious zone of tweaking a puppet. I love it. That's, that's kind of my sweet spot of uh, my creativity. I think part of where this feeling of required patience comes in is I'll watch this and it makes me feel like the system isn't super resilient. Like it seems like if you're doing a progression from point A to point B and you're doing it in a stop motion way, it seems like you have to be so precise 
which makes me think that you have to be really careful and really slow. But maybe I'm underestimating how resilient the process actually is to go from like starting frame to finish frame with everything in between. Do you feel high pressure to capture all the right moments or is is there more resilience there? That's a good observation because that's the key difference with stop motion is that it's called straight ahead animation where you're starting frame one and flowing to frame two and three and four and onward. Whereas, you know, computer animation or hand-drawn animation, you can do the keyframes and then you can time those out and then pepper in in between frames and then space them out even more and add more stuff and tweak it. Whereas stop motion is, it's kind of more of a theatrical performance where you just, you show up on stage, <laughs> you start and you very slowly make your way through the performance. And there's a lot of pressure with that, especially on feature films where, you know, if you have a puppet running 20 feet down a set and that puppet has to hit a mark 400 frames later exactly to line up with a planned camera move and you're going to get there in four weeks. <laughs> you have to, you have to be pretty certain of, of all those frames. So, you know, the, the best stop motion shots are the ones where you can start and not have any questions. You just, you've planned everything, you know exactly how everything's going to go. Um, and you just kind of flow through the performance. That's not to say that things don't go wrong. Um, all the time in stop motion, you're, you're kind of riding a bull and that you're trying to, you know, rein it back and get back, back on track. So it is a, it's a bit of a dance. I need to double click and zoom into what you just said about working on a feature film and you're moving this puppet and you're going to get to this end point four weeks later. Is that really what it's like? Are you really moving, progressing a scene for a period of four weeks to move an object like 40 feet? Yeah, I've done shots where I've gotten maybe 12 frames in a day and it's just that for weeks at a time. So you're doing, you could be doing like half a second, a second of footage in a day. That is insane to me. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So that's why you have like 25 animators in on a roll, right? Yeah. In stop motion, you can, you have many sets going at once. So 20 to 30 sets um, and you produce many of the same actors. So you have, you know, duplicates of every character. Whoa. Okay. This is, this is completely new to me. So in these (laughs) films, you have like duplicates of the same physical actor and you have several, like many sets actually progressing certain scenes. Yeah. How long does it take to shoot a feature length film that is done in stop motion? It's typically about two years of animating. That is an insane. I'm just thinking like from an overhead perspective, if we have 25 animators assume like a a salary of hundred K each, that's 2.5 million per year, just in those people's salaries times two years, (laughs) we're talking about a big budget just to do this. Yeah, but uh, it, am I, am, it's it, it's about half the budget of a well, I don't know about half, but it is lower than a CG production for sure. Because you are you're just producing physical stuff, which are expensive, but not as expensive as a building of computer servers, you know, processing the most complicated water physics or, you know, <laughs> effects and stuff for CG features. I would have to assume that going to s- school for this type of work and getting a role doing feature films, did that feel like you achieved what you set out to achieve like pretty early on? It seems like it's kind of the top of what you'd want to do. Exactly. Yeah. I I started on features. It it was less than a year after I graduated college and I started as a, a junior assistant animator. So doing pretty simple stuff. Yeah. Getting to do features immediately at, you know, the best one of the best stop motion studios in the world was, um, yeah, it felt like I, I peaked immediately <laughs> in, in, in the, uh, the animation world. So what happened, what happened next? Because you're, you're independent now. So at what point did you change your aspiration and say, okay, I've done this. I did this box is checked. I'm going to try something else. A lot of it had to do with geography in that, uh, my wife and I were in Portland I was working at Leica. I worked on three movies and it was about 2017 and I had started to do the social media thing. And it got to a point where I had a large enough audience where I was starting to get interested in brands and all that kind of stuff. And my wife and I decided we should get back to Toronto where we're from, to, you know, start the family, get the roots planted there. So everything kind of lined up where I could, I could, I had a bit of a safety net and in leaping into st- or, um, social media while the life stuff get back to Toronto. So, and then we, we got back here in 2018. 
Was there a period of time while you were doing like beginning the social media stuff that it was at conflict with the work you were doing in the studio or was that encouraged or at least tolerated pretty well? It was supported quite well. It was in conflict in my time in that I didn't have any time to do both, really. Yeah. You know, when you're in a final push of a film, you're doing really long days. You're working, you know, Saturdays a lot of the time and then trying to squeeze in doing, you know, I get home and finally have time to spend with my wife. And then I want to make a video and do this stuff. So yeah, there was, there was conflict in my schedule, but the studio did support it. Was Vine where you started? We haven't really talked about Vine on the show. I don't know if I've had a creator who like got big on Vine and had to continue on, but I'm thinking about the time frame. 2017, was that where it all started? Yeah, I and I didn't really hit Vine that well in that I kind of bookended it. I kind of knew some of the people involved early on in Vine. So I was on it like first day checking it out. And then I kind of just forgot about it. And then it peaked. And then I jumped back on in like 2015. And at that time, there was already the drama of like people were starting to leave. So by the time it shut down, I only I had less than you know, 10,000 followers on there. But I was lucky enough to have a few that did really well. And that brought in um, attention from an agency who I'm still with today. You know, I, in researching this, I looked at your different social media profiles and You have 1.3 million followers on Instagram, 2.1 million on TikTok, 1.5 on YouTube, 180,000 on Twitter, and even 107,000 on LinkedIn. Like you are on all of these platforms. Uh, I'm interested to know the sequencing of that in terms of how you approached and built on each one. Yeah, I think the, so it was Vine. And then that kind of happened alongside Instagram. I think pretty early on Instagram hit a few hundred thousand, almost right when I started posting my stop motion stuff. And then YouTube has been a slow crawl and then recent explosion because of YouTube shorts. Yeah, luckily my content does really well on YouTube shorts and that's like thousands of subscribers a day, every day. And then Twitter's just been like a, you know, been on there for 10, 12 years and a couple big hits have brought in an audience. And then LinkedIn has been recent. I'm doing a big push for LinkedIn to, f- for creators to get on there because it's a really, really good platform currently. Tell me about that. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect someone doing stop motion to be taking LinkedIn seriously. I just don't see that type of content on there. Most of the content I see on there is like pretty one dimensional, pretty boring and yeah. pretty, you know, think boy like. So <laughs> I'm, I'm curious what, why LinkedIn stands out to you as an opportunity for creators in the more like visual and even physical realm. Yeah, I think if you if you look at LinkedIn today versus even a year or two ago, they are doing a lot more of a creator push on there. And video and image are a really big part of it. And I've always thought just from the business side of it is that the eyeballs on LinkedIn are much better and more qualified than the eyeballs on, you know, TikTok and and other platforms. And that the people who are seeing your work on LinkedIn are the people who hire, are the people who have the budgets and can pass your name up to the top to, to get work. So I'm constantly getting inquiries through LinkedIn uh, just by posting on there. So when you went back to Toronto, was the plan to do basically freelancing, freelance work, or was it like, I think I can do sponsorships and brand deals? What was your strategy? I thought about this a lot recently in that my, my plan when I first got back is so different than where I'm at today. So when I first got back, it was very much the only way to make money is YouTube. So you have to start making long form YouTube videos and you have to be the personality. You have to sell the t-shirts. <laughs> you have to, you know, do the badges for like all that kind of stuff. And that's what, that's what I started doing. So I had a series of videos on YouTube that came out of being an animator. And the first one was this video called 100 Walks, where as an animator, you, you always film yourself acting the character before you animate it, just to see all the nuances and little details. Uh, and and those cell phone videos of us acting out the scenes as cartoon characters are often the most fun thing to see. And so my, my wife would always see these videos of me acting as as these cartoon characters. And I was like, oh, that's something I could turn into a YouTube video. So I created this video where I walked on a treadmill in a hundred different ways as different characters. So I'd do it like heavy or you know dainty or skipping or all these different, just to show how movement creates character. And it really took off. It was like millions and millions of views. And I was like, okay, I'll turn this into a series. So... When I got back to Toronto, I started doing this series called 50 Ways where I'd take an action like eating or jumping and do it as 50 different characters. They hit, I don't know what it was at the time, but they just hit 
every single week for like millions of views. And it, it started immediately bringing in pretty decent income. So I started rolling with that. And then just over the years, kind of quickly got bored of, of being in that box. And that, that wasn't really what I trained to do. It wasn't my passion. Um, so over the years, I've really pivoted back to doing stop motion and then completely forgetting about the whole like being a personality selling t-shirts thing. Basically now I'm just a, a one man production studio in that most of my content is nowadays creating commercials for companies. After a quick break, Kevin and I talk about how he works to create campaigns with brands. And later we talk about how he approaches the different social media platforms. So stick around. We'll be right back. If you've been following me for a while, you know how much I believe in memberships as a product for creators like you and me. Earning an income directly from your audience is one of the most sustainable ways to become a professional creator. So I wanna tell you about today's sponsor, Uscreen. Uscreen is a beautiful all-in-one platform that lets content creators earn a living from their videos online. You can host private live streams for your members, sell courses, even get your own branded TV and mobile apps. Seriously, people can watch your video content on an app on their TV, just like Netflix. And the best part Part, that means unlocking predictable recurring revenue. With a Uscreen account, you get video hosting, an out-of-the-box website, full payment and subscription management, a lot of other built-in tools, and plenty of third-party integrations too. And Uscreen makes it easy to get set up. You get access to powerful website themes designed to monetize videos. It's a quick setup and fully brandable with no coding skills required. Just about anyone that wants to make money from their content can do it with Uscreen. It's perfect for coaches, authors, influencers, and entrepreneurs in just about any niche. Right now, Uscreen is being used by creators in fitness, education, news, music teachers, kids entertainment, and more. That includes Yoga with Adrian and Creator Now, just to name a couple. Uscreen is the platform for building a video membership site that is great for generating a sustainable income stream. If you create video content for your audience, I highly recommend checking it out. If you're interested in learning more about Uscreen, check out the link in the description. Welcome back to my conversation with Kevin Perry. I've seen some of Kevin's commercial work and it typically seems to come in two different styles. Sometimes it takes the form of brand sponsoring his content and sometimes he creates dedicated videos for the brands to use themselves. So I asked Kevin if those are two different types of projects in his mind. It's kind of rolled into one these days. It's been morphing in that it was typically just post to my channels, but now there's there's all this backend stuff to support brands with their ads. I found this groove where if I'm going to make, you know, say the Intel commercial, I'm going to make a piece that's really good. It's like TV ready, it's slick, it's polished. And when I post that, Intel has all this backend stuff to uh, post it and put ad spend behind it and push it out to TikTok. And I know that piece of content isn't going to really resonate a lot with you know, the TikTok audience who likes the low budget, you know, talking to the cell phone kind of stuff, the stuff that performs well. So I'll still provide the high budget thing. And then I'll support that in the deal with like a behind the scenes where I'm detailing how I created it. And it's all shot with my cell phone. It's messy. It's voiceover. And that's the piece that I'll post as well. That really gets the views and kind of feeds eyeballs to the main ad. That's crazy. That is such a in-depth big package of work that you're that you're selling there how long do you put into a typical campaign that somebody purchases from you it's usually way longer than i expect but it's it's somewhere around <laughs> classic <laughs> yeah somewhere around three to four weeks probably per job and that's pretty is that pretty like full days for three to four weeks or yeah. is there like time there's a lot of time like thinking up front and storyboarding what's that three to four weeks look like there's usually about a week of setup where it's planning, storyboarding, gathering materials, that kind of stuff. And then a week of production and then usually a week of post. The Intel one was about a full month where there was a second week in there. It was a whole week just of setting up the scene and the camera and the lights and everything and building the puppet. All that. And you're just a one man studio. Yeah. And that's, that's by design. That's, that's very specific. <laughs> that was part of the growth is that when I first started I thought, okay, I have to keep this. Every video has to be bigger. I need to grow a team. I need to end up in a warehouse with a bunch of people. And every video I tried to push bigger and bigger, it kind of got out of my grasp. And as I dialed it back and, and made each video look like one person made it, that's when more success started coming. So that's kind of the brand is that when mm. someone sees my video and they're like, oh, one person was crazy enough to do that stop motion for three weeks. 
That's kind of the, the story of it. Even the VFX stuff, I very much frame it, you know, the camera's on a tripod, it's locked. Oftentimes I'll fake like tap the screen to record and then perform. And it's very much designed to look like just one person in their living room making a video. And so that, that's kind of the brand part of it. And then it also, it's, it helps with the magic, right? If my video looks like it's just a guy in his living room and then all of a sudden there's this Hollywood <laughs> special effect that surprises you, then that, that kind of helps. The pure number of skill sets you would have to employ to do this is kind of boggling my mind because you're talking about storyboarding and planning. You're talking about shooting video, probably mastering audio or at least engineering the audio to some degree. You're talking about visual effects. You're talking about stop motion. This is an insane number of things. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine that you probably feel some pressure at times to hire, but that one that that would directly conflict with this promise that you're talking about. So how do you deal with that tension? I have a pretty small bag of tricks. I think it's not, it doesn't seem to me like it requires that, that much specialty in every area. Like my, my visual effects, all I do is masking. That's it. I don't know anything else. Well, probably a few tricks, but 99% of the time, I'm just like masking. I've gotten good at masking. Then audio, like I just know enough to put like room tone and not have it. <laughs> Just, you know, in the right levels. And a lot of the hiring, I just don't trust anyone to do <laughs> to do my work. I've hired people to do some of the mindless rig removal stuff, kind of the non-creative stuff, but the, the visual effects I'm very specific about, like down to the pixel, down to the frame. You know, it's not just visual effects. It, it needs like an animator's eye. And I think it a lot of stuff specifically needs my eye. So I don't trust a lot of people to do any of that kind of stuff. I think I saw on your Instagram that you, where you do this work is in the basement of your house. Yeah. And it seems like it's probably taking up the majority, if not all of the basement, right? It's the whole basement. Yeah. How has that <laughs> conversation gone? Do you plan to build your own studio at some point or has your, has your wife just conceded the use of the basement? <laughs> well, we, we were in a house renting a house and then we moved in right as the pandemic hit in 2020. And we, we picked this house because of the basement. She found it, uh, yeah, because of the basement. And we kind of knew, okay, I'll own the whole basement space. I'm in the basement right now. And if my wife is existing in the house above me, like sound comes through, which is not great for an audio medium. Do you have to coordinate with that? This is me just commiserating at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now, now with a toddler, um, and it's a very open concept house. My studio doesn't have a door. It's just free oh, wow. space up the stairs to the main level. So yeah, I, I just don't do any sound at this point. Stop motion doesn't need sound. That's all post sound. Or I'll wait till, you know, my toddler's down for a nap and record uh, fully to add in. And then VFX, I'll often just, I haven't even done a VFX video in a while. I don't even know how I do them anymore, but I think I just do post sound <laughs> on them. <laughs> Well, you mentioned that you have an agent that helps you with some of these, these client deals and campaigns and things. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and when it makes sense for someone to explore getting representation? Yeah. So my agent, he, he pretty much just takes care of all the discussions with the client and it's, it's so much more beyond, you know, budget and uh, negotiation, that kind of stuff. It's about, you know, under, it's like big picture, like, I can work, I'm working with this brand and our, our exclusivity window is this. So can I work with another brand that overlaps with that, that kind of stuff, how that all pieces together and just, you know, him understanding what the value is of a campaign, what the value is of a, a story post or a, a link in a bio, that kind of thing. How do you manage capacity on this? Because I imagine he could probably sell more campaigns than you could do in a period of time. So how do you guys communicate in that way to make sure that you are protecting your capacity and you're also prioritizing clients that are either a better fit or have a higher budget? Yeah. So that's been a conversation of how do I scale my business? Do I film more stuff and have people edit it? Um, and it's really come down to, I just don't have enough hours in the day to, to tackle it all. So the only area I can scale is the budget. And it pretty much comes down to a conversation of, if you want to do this campaign with us, you know, it'll take X number of dollars for me to fit it into my schedule. So yeah, it's just, it's just been a matter of kind of scaling the budgets up. That's so interesting because theoretically, I guess that could be infinite, you know, like it could just go up and up and up and with enough demand, like your supply is finite and it's just, it's just economics, baby. Uh, but I would imagine also 
that might get you into a place where the only companies willing to pay a certain threshold of budget become less fun or interesting for you. Do you have to struggle with that at all? I haven't struggled with them being not fun or not <laughs> interesting. Lucky enough to work with some amazing partners that, um, yeah, who, who have the budgets to work with us and are, are willing to let me be as creative as possible. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not good getting into like, you know, tech companies who want me to, you know, showcase an app or something. It's, it's them letting me just saying like, here's a product, go nuts, do your thing. What do the directions look like from them? Are you brought in to help plan the campaign and come up with a creative idea? Or do they come to you with a pretty well baked idea and say, can you deliver on this? They, they typically have a direction and a, and a campaign kind of guideline of, you know, this is the the slogan of the campaign. This is the theme of the campaign. I typically gravitate towards companies or campaigns that involve a product. So I, I really can only wrap my head around physical products for my type of work. I get a lot of offers from gaming companies and apps, which I typically turn down you know 100% of the time because I just can't figure out how to show an app, how to show digital footage. I don't know. It has to be something I can hold and move around. And all along the way, you're probably interested in continuing to share on your own channels things that are just your ideas and things that just you want to do. So how do you balance that? Where do you find the time for your your own work? Currently, I don't. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going on like month eight of not making any of my own. It's been all all branded stuff for a good seven or eight months. Uh, just been, yeah, just been constantly booked up doing stuff and constantly trying to be like, okay, I'm going to next week, I have the time to do my own stuff. And then it, something happens and I either a job gets pushed or a new job comes in. So not, not finding much of a balance these days, but I don't think it's, you know, going into it when I, when I get this busy, I think, oh, I'm not making my own stuff. People are going to hate me and abandon my, <laughs> my channels because it's just all advertisements. But I think I'm finding a good balance with what I was saying in that, you know, I can do the job and do the behind the scenes support and that it, it makes it interesting enough to let people in on that process to kind of to appreciate the work. That's what I was going to ask is if you see a material difference in the completely out of Kevin's head stuff versus behind the scenes of Kevin's work for another client, like is the, is the reception by the audience noticeably different? I think for the, the actual ad, it is noticeably different. I don't think people engage too much with the commercial, but the, the behind the scenes stuff, people really respond well to, um, especially when you kind of frame it in that lower budget cell phone yeah. look. There's, there's an art to, to doing that well. Yeah. At first, I heard you say like, well, I haven't done it in eight months. And my immediate response was, that's a bummer. But then I thought, but is it? Because if you were if you were doing the different things on social media in order to build a pipeline of qualified clients that give you fun work to work on, if you already have that pipeline built, like it doesn't quite matter. But I'm sure like as as a creative person, there are things that have been on the back of your mind, on the back burner that you want to do that you just haven't found time for. Yeah. So I was at the I was at the mannequin store the other day. Um, so, so I, I do have, where's some, the mannequin store? I have something in the works. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a mannequin store in Toronto. Yeah. It's like five minutes away. Um, so I was buying, buying a mannequin. So I got something in the works. Yeah. But the, the me tackling a lot of ads these days, I think it, it kind of fits in with the overall story of my career and that two years ago, all I was doing was my own videos. And now I'm so booked up with work that I'm making advertisements. So I think a lot of the audience appreciates that I'm busy doing the thing I love to do and I'm letting people in on that process. As you think about posting to the different platforms, pretty much every platform now is trying to compete on video to some degree. And I could, I could see the argument where it's like, you could actually just make an unbranded vertical video and just post the same exact video to all these different platforms. How do you approach sharing on these different platforms? Because you're doing all of them well, and they're all different in some ways. So I just love to hear your thought process. Yeah. And to that, I say, finally, it's taken so many years to be able to post a short video to every platform. You couldn't do that a couple of years ago. You had to do the long form on YouTube and then this on Twitter and that on Instagram. But now you can just make a vertical short form video and I just post it the same video on every platform. And I might just tweak the caption, like LinkedIn might be a little more techie or businessy 
Whereas, you know, Instagram might be a little more personal where Twitter might be a little more, you know, flashy to, to help push the, vi- like a little, what's the word? Um, clickbaity almost <laughs> to, okay, yeah, to yeah. help it be shared. So it's, it's more of just the caption stuff, but the video is typically the exact same video for every platform. That's such a hack. It's such a superpower. I don't have that ability to, to just make one thing and post on there because well, that's my how stuff I felt for su- 10 years. Visual. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I've missed my opportunity. This is now the time of Kevin. I've missed yeah. the time of Jay. You, you had these super popular animations, or I guess it's just stop motion, around cutting through fruit. Yes. And you did a couple of them. And every video you did with fruit performed really, really well on those channels. What if you just did fruits forever? Yeah, I don't think it works. You can't, I don't think you can do the same thing. <laughs> forever and ever. And I, I've thought about doing this where I have, I have so many, well, not so many, but I have a decent amount of viral videos and they're, it's almost like I've just reinvented myself every time a new one comes out. And I think you have to do that. You can't, at least I don't feel like I can do the same thing over and over. A lot of people are good at doing that, but I, I want to be on kind of that cutting edge of <laughs> creativity where I want to blow people's minds with something completely original every time. Yeah. I, I've been thinking a lot lately well, with with short form, I get bummed out by thinking that the stuff isn't very enduring. And I've been kind of interested lately in this this idea that if you do short form really well for like a year, two years, and you're able to catalog your work in short form, you could actually just go back into the archive and reshare something like a year later, two years later, literally the same thing. And a lot of people who have seen it would forget and be like thrilled to see it again. And most people just haven't seen it, but I don't, I don't know if that's like an uncool thing to do to just say like, this performed really well two years ago. Let me just yeah. re-upload it. <laughs> that's kind of how I built my website. I'm not good at web design or building websites. So I just made a single page and I just wrote like, here's 10 things I've done. And I just, I made, I just posted 10 videos of like some of my best hits. So that's my, that's my website just to, a lot of people have seen my stuff and don't know that I made it. So I just wanted to remind them. When we come back, Kevin and I talk about how he learned on-camera presence and how he tailors his content to each platform. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. If you like creative elements, you would love my weekly newsletter, Creator Science. I send it every Sunday and it breaks down everything I'm learning about how to be a professional creator. It expands on the things we talk about here on this show and it even goes behind the scenes of my own business and shows you what I'm doing, what I'm experimenting with in my own journey. If you're serious about this, I think it is a must read. More than 14,000 creators already subscribe. So if you are not already subscribed, go to creatorscience.com and subscribe for free and I'll talk to you on Sunday. Hey, welcome back. When you watch Kevin on camera, you notice that he has great on camera presence, which I think is a key part of his success. So I asked him if he learned that or if that came naturally to him. No, it's not natural at all. Um, (laughs) I'm a very introverted behind the camera kind of person. I guess until I'm in front of the camera and it kind of just turns on a bit. It very much came out of being an animator and working on animated films. Some of the first jobs I did on stop motion features, actually I think it was like the first week or two on my very first big job. You know, these big directors and Disney people and stuff. And you'd be in the edit suite and I, you know, I'm like young 20s animator. And they're, they're like looking at my, the planning for my shot. And they're like, eh, I don't know if you're feeling it. Can you like act it out for us right now? And you have to like get up in the edit suite and like perform for them the, the shot. And, you, and they're like, you're not feel like, you know, like feel it, like be the character more. It's experiences like that, that really kind of burst you out of your shell and, and get you to, you know, perform better and be more comfortable. One of my first jobs was in San Francisco. So I just did like an improv class like an entry level, you know, few months of improv, which I hated, but <laughs> I, <laughs> it helped me like, you know, be able to, to perform in front of people and on camera. And then, yeah, just, just years and years of acting as cartoon characters made me more comfortable in front of the camera. I had no idea that was part of the job that you would have to be that active as like a stand in for the character. Did you expect that when you first got into doing the work? <laughs> no, not at all. It was a little bit, there was a couple of classes like that in college, but I didn't think it would be part of the job at all. Do you have any other takeaways from your time working with films at like a Disney level that have 
guided you today towards storytelling or creativity? You know, it seems like that's kind of a, a legendary organization in creativity and storytelling. And curious if you took anything else away that you still think about today. Yeah, a lot of it is just controlling where where the audience is looking. That's That's kind of the big thing for me. You know, when you're creating a performance one frame at a time, you have to completely understand at every frame where the audience's eye should be. Um, you know, not move things too much where they're not looking and move things specifically in a way to keep their attention where they are looking. And to just to have the confidence to hold that for seconds at a time and not, you know, not get distracted and do things that you shouldn't be doing. A lot of that comes from I'm also super interested in magic. So I was just going to say, it sounds like of sleight of hand. It is. Yeah. It's sleight of hand, misdirection, focal, you know, attention. So yeah, it all kind of combines to just controlling where people are looking. I watched your behind the scenes of how you made a video where it was like a TikTok trend with an avocado where you're trying to blow the pit out of an avocado. <laughs> and I'm watching the behind the scenes of this and you're showing, you're saying, okay, here's what I need to do to get people to look at this. So they don't see this thing happening. And that's exactly what you're talking about. That's so fascinating. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know if that plays into the typical world or life of a non-animator, but I'm going to be thinking about it to see if there is like a way where, or a time when I should be really thinking about what are people focusing on in this shot? Yeah, it might be very specifically animation and VFX. It might be. Because yeah, when I, when I perform, that's kind of the, the guiding principle of when I'm acting on camera is where the audience is looking. So a lot of my gestures that I'm planning are designed to, to control where the attention is. With this many views that you get on all of your videos, and now you're posting it to, you know, five different platforms, maybe even six, how do you manage the comments? I don't think I do. I just, I just kind of like see them, see some as they come in and then check out some. Like at, t at TikTok, I see a couple. I don't think I ever scroll through the the comments. A lot of the times I try to not engage with the comments specifically for the VFX stuff because I don't want to give too much away. It's better to have people speculate and to, you know, talk amongst themselves <laughs> than, to, than to give away the secrets. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think I engage or, or manage comments too much. It's so interesting because most of the creators I have on the show, you know, they're trying to build very tight knit audiences to them that are almost like a community. And so it's like, they're trying to be on top of every comment that comes in and they're trying to like build this affinity because they have a product to sell. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're basically building a very public portfolio and resume so that you can very confidently be hired by large organizations with large budgets. And that's, that's the game. That's exactly it. Yeah. I, I think I have the opposite. I don't think I have a tight knit audience at all. And I don't think anyone would ever recognize me out in public or, or from one of my videos. Yeah. I think I'm just kind of like a ghost of, of <laughs> videos. <laughs> well, you do have, you have a $500 course that you put out for sale. Yeah. How has that done relative to your expectations? What expectations did you have? It's done okay. It's, it was a lot of work compared to, um, uh, just a single campaign. It was, you know, months of work. And I don't think financially it met expectations. It's pretty niche. But at the same time, I did it right. I had signed on to do it right as the pandemic hit, right as I moved into this house. And that was when no work, ever, all the campaigns mm. were hit pause. No one was spending money on ads. No one knew what was going on. And so I did have months and months off to do nothing so luckily it did fit into um, my schedule. So I'm, I'm glad I made it. It was a lot of fun to, to put together. I'm glad it's out there to help people learn stop motion. Do you foresee yourself doing more direct to consumer style stuff like that? I don't think so. I don't know if it's, I don't know. What I do is so niche that it's hard. Yeah, I think I've done the stop motion course. If I, I can't get any more advanced than stop motion, it's like, it's basic stop motion. The, if I, the more advanced I get, the less people will want to do it. There's just such a small audience that I, I could maybe do some VFX stuff, but even that's pretty specific. So no, I don't think I'm going to do much more of it. I've debated giving talks about, um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of my videos are, there's a lot of thought that goes into how I caption them and how I present them. So I've 
thought about giving talks about that kind of stuff because I'm very passionate about that. But I've just been so busy that I haven't uh, had the time to plan any of it. <laughs> Tell me more about that because uh, a moment ago you're talking about, well, now we're at a point where I can basically upload the same video to any of these platforms. So how does packaging and presentation come into play in your mind? Yeah, so I think Twitter is a really interesting one for this in that you can basically make any image go viral on Twitter with the right caption by giving it the right context. What's an example? Like a baby smiling, right? <laughs> a picture of a baby smiling. Okay, there's a million babies that are smiling. But if you say that baby is like just got uh, ear surgery and is hearing his mom's voice for the same for the first time, that's a pretty meaningful image. That's a special image that people are going to share. <laughs> so right. giving it the right caption or context is everything for what makes it shareable. You know, when I post a video, if I if I just tweak the details a little bit to make it a little more interesting, um, that that's kind of all like the whole. That's kind of a world of difference. And the way I typically go about it is understanding. Now I'm getting into my, this is my lecture. <laughs> I love this. You know, the key, I've kind of pinpointed the key to shareability is like how someone tells their friend about your video. Like, hey, have you seen that video where X does X? Like where that guy turns into a bunch of random stuff, like falls and turns into stuff. If someone can't tell their friend about your video like quickly like that, then you, it's not going to be shareable. So oftentimes I caption how I think I want people to tell their friends about my video. <laughs> so that one of me falling and turning into stuff I just put it as like, here's a collection of me turning into random objects. Cause I knew that's how it's literally the caption. Yeah. That's how people <laughs> should tell their friend about my video. So that's kind of like the secret sauce of how I've got a lot of these videos to be uh, popular. That's crazy. I haven't thought about that. The Netflix one, I did the Netflix intro where I redid it all with yarn. And that one, I think I, I titled it recreating the Netflix intro with $30 worth of yarn. Cause I knew I wanted people to tell their friends, oh, have you seen that Netflix intro? made with like a cheap amount of yarn. And I think that one, I that was at least $200 worth of yarn, but I just lied and said it was $30. Because <laughs> I, I was like, okay, it's, it's funnier if it's a lower budget. And it, and it like amplifies like this, you know, Hollywood product versus like a cheap amount of product. At what stage in the process are you thinking about this framing? Is it at the ideation stage? Is it at the finish line? Is it through the middle? I mean, I'm sure the answer is like kind of all over the place, but typically. It's a little all over the place, but I knew the Netflix one, I had that one, that title, basically that was the, the concept of it, was I knew that would be how people would tell their friends about it. I hear that feedback from people on YouTube all the time too. It's like the more advanced someone gets on YouTube, they say, basically, I need to have a good idea and think of it from the standpoint of the title, if not the title and the thumb line or thumbnail before I actually make it or yeah. even commit to making it. Yeah. Think it's about crazy. any, any viral video you've ever seen. You can tell a friend about it. It's basically like, Hey, have you seen the video where blank does blank? And in my mind, if there's a third blank, you've lost it. Like, that's it. <laughs> it has I to be, love that framework. It has to be so simple. I love that framework because, yeah, like most of sharing still is word of mouth. And of course, like if you're on TikTok, you can just like hit share and send it to your friend. But if you're in conversation, someone says something that drives a thought in your mind, you need to be able to say, hey, have you seen the thing where blank does blank? Yeah, you have to. Yeah, you have to. You have to give people the confidence to tell their family about it at the dinner table, like to bring it up. Like that's that's going to be. You have to make it simple enough that they can pitch it. <laughs> and also search for it, probably, because they're, yeah. they're either going to remember your name or they're going to remember that description and need to search for that in some way. Yeah. So you're not much of a long form caption person on Instagram. No. <laughs> Oftentimes it's like an emoji or like a, a couple words. <laughs> I like that because a lot of people are long form caption people and I just, I've never gotten into that, but it seems to work for some people, not usually for like a video that's meant to be viral, but for like a still image and a post they want to go well. I did it. I did long form, uh, at the start of my Instagram career where I was, I was working on animated features. And that, that's basically all the content I had was the, the time lapses and the fun, like Hollywood production stuff I was doing. And I wanted to appear like a, an expert who could pass on a lot of cool information. So I would just fill almost like blog posts with those. Um, so I did a lot of the long form stuff early on. The other thing that I think makes some of your work so viral is you make everything so perfectly loopable. 
maybe that's like a, another advantage you have of being in uh, stop motion or animation where it's easier for you to do that. But it feels like something people could take more advantage of because I would assume, you know, if you let something loop in the second time and you're still watching, that's got to go crazy with the algorithm to say this is something good. How much time do you put into making sure your stuff is actually very loopable? It's yeah, it's very much a decision. And if, if it is going to be loopable, it's going to be perfectly loopable <laughs> uh, down to like the, the pixel. And yeah, a lot of that is is kind of the algorithm and keeping people watching and that they don't know it's starting again or or it's there's some kind of satisfying element where they want to watch it again. And that's yeah, that's kind of the pitch I give brands a lot is that I want to make ads that people want to watch twice. That's kind of the holy grail of of advertising is that if someone if someone sticks around to watch an ad again, then you've you've really got them. That's awesome. Well, I guess to wrap this up, I'm just curious. Everything seems to be going super, super well. It seems like it seems like all up and to the right. Is there anything that you're currently trying to work through or struggling with as a creator today? Maybe time. <laughs> I think everyone struggles with that is, is scheduling. You know, working at home with a toddler. It's uh, yeah, it's 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 basically just scheduling. No, it's going pretty well. Like I'm, I'm overall very, very happy with uh, with what I'm doing. It would be nice to do more of my own stuff, but uh, the ultimate goal is working, is doing what I love, making cool stuff for companies. So I can't complain that I'm too busy with that. People like Kevin who have a unique visual skill set have such an advantage right now in our short form visual world. But it was fun to hear just how much he thinks about packaging his content. And I think that's something that we can all learn from. If you want to learn more about Kevin, you can visit his website at kevinperry.tv or just about any social media platform. Links to all of that are in the show notes. Thanks to Kevin for being on the show. Thank you to Connor Conaboy for editing this episode. Thank you to Emily Klaus for making the artwork for this episode. Thanks to Nathan Todd Hunter for mixing this show and Brian Skeel for creating our music. If you like this episode, you can tweet at Jay Klaus and let me know. And if you really want to say thank you, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.